Um, cool. So crop planning is, uh, how many of y'all are intimidated by the idea of crop planning? Okay, Ch just Chelsea and Christian. Everyone else is, is good. <laughs> Nora's had a little bit of crop planning, so she should be, she could teach this class pretty much. Um, so crop planning is super personal. It like, you just have to figure out what works for you and your brain. So I'm gonna walk you through how I crop plan, but it's just gonna give you a glimpse into how my brain works. Hopefully it, it, you can use it as a template and kind of like figure out what works best for you. But like when I first started farming and learning about crop planning, it was like, what, how do you make sense of this? Um, Cause there's so much to consider when crop planting, especially in our climate, which like we were just talking about with Carl is like, Kind of like we have these guides, but they kind of don't always apply because our weather is so unpredictable. Like it might never freeze here. It might be 90 degrees till November. So we have, there's just a lot to consider that doesn't often fit into the natural or like the common paradigms of gardens or farms in the rest of the country. So when Annie and I first moved here, we kind of, we did a lot of like experimenting and adapting with what will grow through when based on what I'd already known how to grow or learned how to grow in Massachusetts. And a lot of it did apply, but at wildly different times of the year. So with that, these are some of the things that I think about when crop planting. I think the most important thing is what do you like to eat? Like a farmer once told me who like one of our, my farm teachers once said like, don't bother growing anything that you don't like to eat because you're not gonna care about it. You're not gonna like go check on it in the field. You're not gonna spend the time it takes to like really make it happy. So I don't think that's entirely true like across the board, but I think it's good advice to start with stuff that you are excited about eating. Um, so we are in zone. 9A, which is different from where LSU is, for instance, which is zone 8B. And we're right on the cusp here of getting frost, as you've seen this last month or so, where we've had these kind of cold nights. Last night, it's unclear if we got a frost. We had frost on our windshields, but maybe not in the fields. Hey, Chris. Um, oh. So, you know, you kind of just know like your farm, know where you're at, what your weather, what your weather's like, if you have extreme weather that you know is going to happen. Like if you know you're going to get a frost, factor that in. If you, like I kind of operate under the assumption that we are not going to get a deep frost and we'll deal with it if we do. Because we're, we're that close to the borderline of will we won't we <clears throat> um another thing to consider definitely what do your customers like to eat like are you gonna are you gonna do you want to grow things that people already know people are already excited about which might thank you which might also be already pretty saturated at the market but you won't have to do that education of like what's a kohlrabi or what's a parsnip? You know, we were talking about parsnips the other day. I've never seen anyone grow parsnips here. Have you, Marcus? Pars parsnips, has anyone ever grown parsnips here? Yeah. So just like think about, you know, the, the market relevance and also the cultural relevance of what you're trying to grow. Like, like up in Massachusetts, our customers didn't really, they weren't really familiar with collard greens or turnip greens or okra. Like those things never sold at market because people just aren't familiar. But down here, like we couldn't grow enough collard greens and turnip greens. So just, you know, kind of be aware of, of your market, your, your region. Um, so then getting into the kind of, let me move this. 
the kind of uh, logistical details of of growing is, are you gonna direct seed most of your crops? You know, like we have our jang, it's beautiful, but not everything you grow would make sense to, to direct seed as amazing as that would be. Um, or are we gonna transplant it? If you're gonna transplant it, you gotta think about seed starting. Are you gonna have a greenhouse space or just like a, a really sunny window here because you can kind of start stuff here and move it outside sooner than you might in the north where it's truly gonna really influence the growing pattern of a crop when it's going out into like 30 degree temperatures. But here, you know, you can, if you get it in the sun, if you get it going, put it in the sun, it's really not that different between our greenhouse inside and our greenhouse outside when the, the ends are open. You know what I mean? Like if that makes sense. So we just, we don't have to think as much about heat here, about insulation. Like it's it's a little a little more forgiving, uh, where we might be able to how and and where we might be able to start our seeds. Um, but you also don't have to start your own seeds. You can buy transplants in. Like we bought parsley, celeriac, sage. We bought these things that we know we have a hard time growing from Banner Greenhouses, which is in North Carolina. And I like that, but shipping can be a real adventure. You never know how the plants are gonna show up. It, you know, they try to, they do their best thing to keep them upright, but we've definitely had issues where they've come upside down. Hundreds of plants have fallen out. It's, it can be a kind of a nightmare. We do have a local nursery, Langridge, which is in Bellchase. And so they're pretty close and convenient. They're, they're not organically grown. So we are certified naturally grown. We have to consider that. We can really only use them if we don't have another alternative or if we pretty explicitly say that they were not certified naturally grown. They were not grown using those methods. Um, but they're a good backup. I, like, if we have major crop failure, then I'll, I'll always kind of check their, their list to see what they have. Um, are we gonna be harvesting this crop just once and that's it? Or are we gonna do, do multiple harvests like of our bunching greens where the plant just kind of hangs out there and we go and we harvest when it's, when it's big or like our parsley and stuff like that. Um, if we are going to just harvest it once, is it going to be just once, once? Like um, a lot of our kind of storage crops, like we do like two big seedings of carrots in the fall and then we just get them all out at once. But in the spring, we're going to do successions of carrots where we're going to do them every two weeks. So you want to be thinking about these things because, you know, when I first started farming, it was kind of news to me that like you have to constantly be planting stuff. You know, I think. I think a lot of gardeners who are just starting out, when they ask me questions, it's always like, well, what should I plant? Or like, my, or like this died, what do I do? And I was like, well, you've got to grow more of it. Like our stuff dies too, but we've got the next one coming, the next one coming. So it's kind of like, oh, you kind of have to like be planting throughout the whole season if you want a, a truly diversified farm. Um, Yeah. Um, so for for Chris and Michael, Annie was talking about how in the north our succession planting was like much was our season for succession planting is much shorter. Like we would have like three spring successions of broccoli, but here we can kind of have like you know like six months worth of successions because we can go straight from spring through fr fall through spring. Um, so it's just thinking broader down here because 
the seasons just kind of all blend together um, and we could grow things pretty much all year here. Um, yeah, Christian. Yeah, uh, so Christian is asking, how, how do you know how much time to put in between successions? Um, so that depends on a few factors. It depends on how much you're planting in each succession how, and how long you want your harvest window to be. So I just kind of, I kind of settled on two weeks being, so we have 50 foot beds. I mean, I'll go through it a little, yeah, I'll go through it a little bit, but yeah, so I'll give you a short answer now, which is you just, you kind of have to think about like your harvest window and how much you're growing and kind of like just estimate how much you'll need before you get to the next one. Um, but we'll go through kind of the, the more details of that. Some of the math of it is also a lot. Of, I will say just a lot of crop planning is estimating and then adjusting as you go. Like we use a lot of math formulas for it to just refine our estimate, but it's still an estimate based on really when you're first doing it based on nothing. <laughs> based on like, if you've done market research, maybe if you've talked to other growers, yes, if you've you know looked at the, the LSU planting guide, sure. But, uh, but it's just a lot of like educated or uneducated guessing. Um, okay, so, and then days to maturity is something else that you consider when more when considering your calendar, you know, when do you want to start harvesting something? Like when is the first market? Then you back up with your days to maturity. Um, but those are kind of just general questions that, uh, that I think about when crop planning. So now I'm going to walk you through our crop plan and all the many pieces of it. And then what I want to do is have you all pick a crop in a certain category and we'll kind of go through and um, do a, like a mock crop plan with those crops based on our spring season. So we'll have to pick stuff that we'll grow right now. Um, okay, so we, when Annie and I first started, we were just growing on Kentucky Street and we were focusing on things that grew quickly because we didn't have a lot of space so we could harvest them um, quickly and multiple times. So we were doing all successions there, except for like, we did put in some kale and like hot peppers and other peppers and eggplant towards the end of the season, which, which I don't, which wasn't a good idea. We moved to the West Bank. Um, so if you have a little, only a little bit of space, I think it's a good idea to focus on crops that grow quickly and you can grow multiple times for as long of the year as possible. So we focused on like salad greens, some cooking greens, and then also like radishes because they're so fast. Um, Ellis, when Ellis first started his farm, he just seeded like tons of radishes and turnips because he knew that they grow fast. And it was like, just start with something. Like that's a really good thing to start with because they you can store them and they grow really fast and they're colorful. So. People will buy them. Um, but he had a lot of radishes and turnips. So we think about, okay, for our salad greens this year, we, this used to include um, like arugula and our own mesclun mix, but because we're buying in from Compostela for our farm share now, all of those baby greens, we don't have that on here, but that used to be on here. So this year we're just growing lettuce for our salad greens coming from our fields. So I've been doing this lettuce experiment for the last few years, trying to figure out what lettuce grows well here. I haven't settled on a variety that I love. So we're trying both bigger heads and little heads. Like if you look through the lettuce sections of those seed catalogs, you're gonna see just like dozens of varieties of lettuce. And you'll, you know, when reading through those descriptions, that's when you'll kind of determine, okay, this one's a little more heat tolerant, this one, you know, resists 
this disease. So these are all factors that you, you can consider for your own needs. Um, so lettuce, ideally, we'll just have it all the time. So we will seed, we'll or we'll transplant a bed of lettuce. So here's beds per succession. This is a roughly 50 foot bed on Kentucky Street. It's a little smaller, as you can see up here, it's 45 feet. But we, I just call it 50 feet in my, in my mind. Um, so that's, so every two weeks, I feel like for me, at, the, at this point, that's fast enough. Like we're not harvesting a whole bed of anything, usually in one week. So for me, like I, you could seed something every single week, but that's also a lot of work. I've like, I feel like for our needs, we've gotten to a point where we can do things every two weeks and get the same benefit as if we were doing it every week, like get the same quantity. Like I'd rather see two beds every two weeks instead of one bed every week, if that makes sense. Um, like you wanna think about kind of consolidating your work also. Like it's a lot of work to get the jang out, to set it all up, to, to seed when you could, like things can usually hang out for that extra week, if, even if they're, ready to harvest. Um, so that's that's part of what you want to think about too, Christian, is like with your harvest window, you have a little bit of time. Like you don't usually have to get, get stuff immediately when it's ready, unless you're at the tail end of the season and it's stuff is growing like crazy because it's late May and it's just like, that's when you're, you're already kind of probably pushing the, uh, the climate with what you're growing. Um, so then, you know, for, for lettuce, we think about what's the earliest, <clears throat> what's the earliest in our fall season that we can plant it. So we plant, this was, this was a little early, like we didn't really have, like when, when did we start having good lettuce? If we even have it yet. Yeah. So we're. Uh, this is transplants. Yeah, and the and we had, you know, we, our greenhouse is pretty shady. Um, so stuff stuff does okay. We've had some issues germinating lettuce in this heat, but we were really pushing it to try and get lettuce in our first farm shares in September, which we, you know, we had some just like weird lettuce that maybe we cut loose. So anyway, we wanted it in September. I usually think you can check out the days to maturity here for, this is usually an average of the varieties that we grow, but days to maturity is a, a, a fact that you can find in your seed catalogs. It'll tell you what, what specific variety, for each specific variety, how long it'll take in ideal conditions to get to a harvestable point. Um, it depends. It'll usually say if it's from seeding or direct or transplanting. Usually, if it's like a most often transplanted crop, like your bigger crops, like tomatoes and peppers and broccoli and things like that. Those are usually from transplanting, but it will usually say uh, in the seed catalog or on their website. Um, so I'll say here like 38 days from TP, that's 38 days from transplanting. So our goal was to have lettuce like, you know, early, as early on as possible. So I'm looking at 38 days from transplanting. Okay, that means that we have about a month and a week from when we wanted it, um, where we have to think about putting it in the ground. Yeah, Mike, Michael, do you have a question? No, I don't, no. Okay. Um, so, but realistically, like we're not gonna be doing anything in early to mid July, like this was even an experiment in pushing it 
we had Nora start some seeds in late July, trying to get a jump on stuff. Some stuff did okay. Most of it really struggled in the heat. Um, so you kind of have to work backwards. So like this, honestly, probably we projected putting it in the ground August 24th, which means we were hoping to have it ready by early, late September, early October, which even was still too hot. Um, I usually estimate that things are in our greenhouse for four weeks if they are in your traditional plug trays. That doesn't always exactly work out, but like, I don't, I'm not trying to predict exact dates. So it's good enough. It's worked well enough for our planning purposes. Um, we just kind of plant things as they're ready to go without having them projected like needs to be in the ground by date. Um, it's different for paper pot transplanting. It's much shorter, but I'm not gonna talk about paper pot because it's kind of a specialty tool that changes all the crop planning. Um, so anyway, you can kind of see we're working backwards from kind of when we want it, or we're working forwards from when are we starting our season? Like when's the earliest that like we can have Nora start seeds in the summer without just basically sacrificing them all to the heat. And then what of all of the things we grow could feasibly even grow that time of year when it's 90 degrees. Um, so when we were choosing these lettuces, we're, we're trying to pick varieties that like the heat or can tolerate the heat. No lettuce really likes the heat. Um, so we tried it, didn't go so well, but worth trying. So that's kind of, that's kind of an overview of how we think about these dates where we're at um, first greenhouse seeding week, week of first planting is like roughly four weeks later. Um, cool. And then successions, we're just gonna plant lettuce every week for all of our whole season. And we're gonna try and have it all the time. Um, I might look at it this off season and refine it a little bit so we're not wasting our first couple of plantings of lettuce because it's so hot. But basically our fall is roughly a 20 week season. We're doing it every two weeks. So we've got 10 fall successions. This little head lettuce, we were phasing out some extra seed that we had. That's why there, there's only three successions here. Otherwise we would have had also 10 successions. Um, for cooking greens, it's all, it's all very similar. Um, raising mix is something we direct seed on Kentucky Street. So that gets three beds per succession or four, now four beds per succession. Um, so does, does this kind of overview make sense? This first page is really an overview where we're going through each crop and we're like, when do we, when can we start it? How often do we want to harvest it? And what kind of, of planting does it require? Like direct seeding, transplanting for us also, is it going to be on Kentucky Street or is it going to be on the West Bank? Also, is it going to be from Banner Greenhouses? That's where you see this purple highlight where we have some stuff like parsley coming from Banner Greenhouses. So this is like, this is the first page that Annie and I look at when we're crop planting, we're thinking, Okay, this is like the full picture of, of our farm season. And we go in and plug in all of these, these little details for each crop that we wanna grow. So we've got herbs, roots, cucurbits, which we grew very few of in the fall and none of them did well. Um, alliums, other coal crops like your cabbages, broccolis, and then other kind of random crops that don't have a, a, an obvious category. So from this, then we're going over to our greenhouse overview. So then we're taking from that kind of bigger picture first page. And again, just bear with me because this is just how my brain works. And we're extracting everything that's grown in our greenhouse 
and we're saying, okay, so the big head lettuce, the little head lettuce, bok choy, choy sum, napa, all these things, these are all the things that Annie and I determined. Let's give it a shot and start it on July 20th in the greenhouse and see how, how it does. Can we get stuff to grow that early? And we did like this, you know, this kale that Nora seeded the week of July 20th, that's the dino kale that's out in our fields right now. It's not looking that great though. And part of me wonders, like was the plant stressed in the heat early and it never kind of like really took off and thrived. It also had a lot of pest pressure. So th this is kind of like, these are things that we'll think about when crop planting for next season is like, maybe it was too early, like stuff survived. It's survived, it's still there, but we haven't gotten that much harvest off of it. It doesn't look great. Uh, we all know what happened to the chard. That's not, that's gonna be taken off the list for next year. Um, the Amara mustards too, and the collards, like these are all things that, that we were kind of pushing the envelope on for, um, for weather and time-wise. Um, so once we kind of have these crops listed out, these are, you know, then the next week we decided to do these crops, which are all, as you can see in the paper pot, these are all in six inch paper pots, four inch paper pots. These take less time in the greenhouse. So we started them a week later. So they would be ready at the same time as those 720 crops that we started in the greenhouse. Um, so we're kind of going through and saying like, what kind of, like what size plug tray um, or what size paper pot chain are we gonna grow these seeds in, in our greenhouse? And plug trays, most of what we grow come, is in a 128, which means there are 128 plants in that tray. Um, plug trays are, are all the same size. They just have different amounts of holes. So they're all 10 inches by 20 inches, um, which is nice because they fit their carrying trays all equally, but the, the number of holes um, definitely matters. I've, things, things don't, like I don't wanna, I don't want stuff to hang out in our greenhouse for very long because it's so small. So I'm kind of trying to get stuff to the point where it can be planted, um, basically to like the first point at which it could be planted. And then I want us to, to go and transplant it into the field, especially on the West Bank where we have a lot more space. That's a little bit different on Kentucky Street, but it kind of plays out the same. Um, so we're just trying to like get a jump on something that might be direct seeded. And that results in us mostly growing things in 128. So there are some bigger crops, usually crops that require more spacing require a bigger plug tray. So we grow like Napa cabbage, zucchini, winter squash, um, and like broccoli and stuff. We grow those in 72s, which means there are 72 plants. Um, you probably notice the trays are a little bigger. The, the plugs are a little bigger. They're, they're easier to pull out. That's not always the case because their roots don't always form enough in that bigger cell by the time we want to transplant them. Like we, we used to grow a lot in 50s up at First Root Farm where Nora and I worked in Massachusetts. We had, we had more greenhouse space and stuff can really like thrive in 50s. It can really grow really big and robust in, in a greenhouse where theoretically you're paying a lot closer attention. You're kind of pampering those plants, especially if you don't if it's not warm enough up north to put them out in the ground yet, but you wanna start them early, then you might grow stuff in 50 to give it more time to be in that kind of climate controlled greenhouse environment. Um, but here, like we can kind of always put stuff in the ground. Like I'm not worried about the ground being too cold. I'm just worried about being too hot, but it's gonna be hot in our greenhouse or the ground. So that like those space concerns, I don't really think about very much. So I'm just trying to like cram as much as possible into our greenhouse. That's why I'm using 128s and 72s. 
it also mostly works fine. It could probably be better. That's, that's like the moral of our crop plan. It mostly works fine. Um, so then I'm, I'm thinking, okay, how many trays of each of these plug trays am I gonna need per planting? So no, with like lettuce, I'm doing one bed per planting. Most things are getting one bed per planting. Some things um, like some of these like kale and chard, that's just getting one planting. So there's gonna be a lot more beds, but for things that we're doing successions of, it's usually just one bed per planting. Um, so I've got, So, yeah, yeah, different farms would have different beds per planting. A lot of farms also grow on bigger beds, like 100 foot beds, 300 foot beds. I like to grow on 50 foot beds because it's like, feels like a manageable amount for all the work that goes into making a bed and planting the bed. So um, I also find that for our scale right now, 50 feet worth of a crop is a really good like two week amount worth of food for our needs. So um, these are also things to consider with, you know, your own setup. But this, this would be, I'm trying to think if there's, this is just some mental math to figure out how many trays. Um, there probably should be a formula in here, but there isn't. <laughs> there is. Well, it's so Where? Uh, Where here? Yeah. Total bed per planting. Yeah. Okay. This is probably Annie setting up formulas here, so. Annie might have to explain the formulas. But anyway, this is also, so this is, this is a little more insight into my brain than maybe is gonna make sense. But like, if you, okay, so say you wanna plant lettuce, a 50 foot bed of lettuce at, rows, at four rows per bed, spacing at 12 inches. So, how many plants is that? Four rows, 12 inches, 50 feet. 200 plants. 200 plants. Thank you, Michael, and other people who did mental math. So 200 plants, well, we're, we know we're working with this constraint of 128 cells. I don't like to see partial trays if we don't have to, like I like, like if you're going to take up that space in the greenhouse, like I want that whole tray to have seeds in it. I want to be growing plants in as much space as possible. So I'm not going to grow, and I'm not going to grow a 72 and a 128, which would equal 200, but mm -hmm. that space I want. Um, say I hate the food that I eat last night because it got me feeling oof today. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to grow in two 128s and grow 256 plants and assume that we can either squeeze them in or that our germination isn't going to be perfect. So it, it's like kind of, again, that estimating, you kind of figure like, okay, I'm going to grow 25% more plants than I need, but I can probably squeeze them in if we do like slightly less than a foot spacing or, you know, our bed is a little bit wider here so we can throw in another row. Like we've all been transplanting enough on the farm to know that it's not exact. We're just trying to put it in. They're like, okay, we're kind of estimating with our hands. So it kind of just works out that we figure out what to do with it in the field. Um, some farms are really, really precise about this. Like, uh, Laura, who Nora and I worked with in Massachusetts, she was a lot more precise about this and a lot more precise about like where things were going and exactly how many plants. And that's another way to do it. But for us, we're, I'm kind of a little more like, we'll deal with it. Um, Is there a, like, if you're 
Um, Annie's asking if we were more mechanized, would it be more important to be more exact? Um, yeah, I think so. Like you're, not, you know, unless you're gonna, because then, because if you're mechanized, then your tractor or your your transplanter is transplanting exactly at the spacing you require. So you can very exactly say how many plants will go in this space. So then you'll just have to manually deal with whatever's left. Um, so if you don't want to have to deal with that, that's fine. I don't I don't mind like I'm also happy to like give plants to someone else if we have a handful left. So it's just like I'd rather not do that work on the front end. I'd rather do that work on the back end of dealing with extra plants and just dealing with it in real time, determining, okay, we can fit them in here. Um, does that make sense? people. Um, so this is, this is our greenhouse overview. And we know from page one, that we're doing lettuce every two weeks, and we're doing 10 fall successions. So every two weeks, 10 fall successions. So then when we go the overview, we've now figured out our plot size, size, number of trays per planting based on our rows per bed spacing and total beds. The germination temp is just, that's just kind of good to know what kind of weather it likes. We don't really use that at this point. I would like to get more precise about germinating, but anyway, you can kind of ignore this column for now. Um, so the question was, do we use a heating pad for winter in transplants? Yes, we have done that. Um, so that is a, a place where, where germination temperature would come in handy. Um, for things like, well, basil, but we don't do that that early. So I don't have, this was our fall crop plan, so I don't have our spring crops on here. But for things like tomatoes, eggplant, peppers, we do germinate them on a heating pad because we have, we'll be germinating them like in, in January to um, be ready to transplant in March. Um, so yeah, good question. That is one very low tech way that you can kind of uh, control temperature. And he's asking about domes, which are another way that you can protect. Um, yeah, so you can you can get these like plastic domes that fit perfectly on a tray in the greenhouse. And those do, they create like a little micro greenhouse environment. Um, yeah, you can definitely do that. I don't, those get have just gotten kind of really nasty in this climate. I think it, they just get kind of like covered in algae and I don't know. Worth looking into if you really need to add temperature or like pest protection. We used to have mice issues in Massachusetts that we would use domes for. Um, so that's another kind of like temperature and or pest control. Um, okay, so, so because I know that like lettuce, we're doing 10 successions. Then I, I have this column here where I'm writing the, the week number that we're um, gonna be seeding it in the greenhouse. And this is just so that, this is just kind of a cheat sheet for me because this is what Nora sees when she is seeding things. This is our kind of like more user-friendly stripped down information for each week what we're seeding in the greenhouse. So this, I have week one here. So I can just toggle back and forth knowing that, okay, lettuce is gonna be in week one and week three. So I can skip week two. So it's just the way that my brain allows me to kind of quickly go through, go down this list and look for all the threes when I'm working on what are we doing in week three. Um, these things all are happening in the in the even weeks, it looks like. So you'll see 
when we go to our kind of like field greenhouse sheet, you'll see that things all kind of alternate every other week from each other. Um, and here is where I start to think about varieties. Like you'll notice that we haven't talked about at all about varieties in our first two sheets, because we don't really need to think about that yet until we're actually getting into the greenhouse, what are we seeding? Um, and so here is where we'll kind of break down again, what kind of tray, how many trays, how many plants does that result in? Because it's only a half of a tray, how many seeds per cell, germination temp, which again is just kind of a reference point. And any notes here, like if I want to use up all the seed, I'll say that, or, you know, if we're having germination issues with a certain variety, which usually is written on the packet, um, then you might want to put more seeds per cell because they might not all germinate. Um, so does, does that, does that kind of like flow of from the, our overview our full farm overview to our greenhouse overview to our greenhouse binder sheet, which, which is just a literal binder in our shed that Nora uses to see what is getting seeded that week. Um, does that make sense? And does anyone have any questions so far? It's a, a brain roller coaster. Cool. Uh, <laughs> some sort of process behind is it enlightening or is it darkening? <laughs> I, have a, I have a question. Is there any way that you're, as you're thinking about what's getting seeded, are you thinking about what's coming out at the same time as it's going in? Are you timing it that way, or is it just during this, so we'll be able to have the space, or is it just like, well, I know a lot of it is like, okay, where are we going to find these beds? Um, so Annie is asking, are when thinking about what to seed or what to plant, are we referencing it against what's coming out of the field? Like, are we planning, okay, these are going to be in the field for this long, therefore, at this point in time, we can have these things ready to go. Um, the answer is yes and no. So when we started on Kentucky Street and we had very limited space, the answer was yes. We were trying to be more diligent about tracking our days to maturity. So you kind of want to work with that calendar of like, okay, I'm starting it. I'm like, when are things going in the ground? Was, was what we were thinking about most on Kentucky Street. And then how long will they be in the ground? And so then we kind of looked at our crop map to see how many beds we had and kind of started, we did a rough estimate of like, okay, we have, if we plant five beds every two weeks and they take 30 days, then, you know, in week one, we have five beds. In week three, we have 10 beds. In week five, we have 15 beds. By week five, we should be harvesting what's in week from week one, those five beds. So we did we did do a little bit of that when planning on Kentucky Street. And I recommend if you have a space constraint that then you kind of have to do that. Yeah, so um, how do I get how do I move this? Um uh, yeah, so we do have a crop map where, let me see if I can get it here without triggering something. So this is our West Bank crop map where we just have um, a literal map of all of our beds and I write the date. This is the date that, every, that this crop went in the ground, not the date that it was seeded in the greenhouse. This is just a field picture. So it doesn't have anything to do with the greenhouse. 
Um, and this is just so that we can keep track of, of what's happening in our field at any given time. These, these dates are uh, harvest dates. So this is the first harvest. So um, Monday was the first day that I harvested this crop of broccoli. Um, so it's kind of interesting too, at the end of the season, you can come through and look at, at how did your days to maturity pan out different times of year. So this broccoli was growing as the light was diminishing and it was getting colder. So I expect that the days to maturity are slightly longer than what was predicted, but I think it's probably not that far off. It's about two months, about 60 to 65 days. So maybe it was a week shorter, but I don't remember exactly. But anyway, these are, these are ways that, that you could track uh, your space in your field and what is going to be in there and for how long. And it definitely helps to have a season kind of under your belt to do that. So you can use real data, but um, you can also use the estimated days to maturity for that. And then I kind of gave, when we did that the first season, I think I gave like a three week buffer. So like two week harvest buffer plus a week of uncertainty around how well would that crop, crop grow. Um, so it, it, yeah, you, you know. Then on the website, we also find the during the Yeah, so Annie was saying, we also give time on the West Bank for tarping, which is how we turn beds over out there for the most part. Um, the West Bank, but on the West Bank, because there's so much space and because we have the ability to add to still add new beds. I'm not, I'm not paying as close attention to our, our space needs out there. And I'm more just growing what we need for our, our current retail outlets or current like markets. Um, and, and kind of knowing that we'll expand as we go. And also the, this crop plan, like we do this at the beginning of every season and we inevitably go back and change it constantly throughout the year. Like, like I've given Nora like four or five versions of like what we need to be seeding in the greenhouse. I've changed our direct seeding schedule three or four times this fall. Last year when the pandemic hit, we basically did a whole new crop plan to grow more food because the demand was so crazy. Um, we also And right, and we cut out our baby greens in the middle of the season because we stopped going to the farmer's market and started buying baby greens in for our farm share and use that space to grow other things on Kentucky Street, which is where we have been growing most of our baby greens. So, so the crop plan is like should be this kind of like living document that that gets updated. Ideally, we'll get to a point where we don't have to constantly change it and we can kind of just use what we did last season and maybe tweak it a little bit. Like that's the real sweet spot that we're all going for, but we're still in a pretty young, pretty experimental phase of our farm. So we're constantly trying new things and then uh, untrying them the next year when they don't work. Okay. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so the question was, was what was kind of like reasoning or thought process and uh, economic reasoning behind cutting out our baby greens in the spring and just sourcing from Compostela Farm who specializes in, in baby greens and salad mixes. Um, so the, the reasoning behind that was because all of our infrastructure for processing baby greens is on Kentucky Street where we do have really limited space. And Kentucky Street is also the only 
spot right now where we can use the paper pot transplanter. Um, and there are other things that are just better grown on Kentucky Street because also because of processing facilities. So we increased our grazing mix, which is kind of like a salad mix, but bigger. Um, and we also increased some of the like other kind of like specialty cooking greens that we could grow in succession, like some of the like komatsuna. Um, we tried choy some on Kentucky Street. So it freed, the decision was to free up space to grow more specialty things. Right. Are they to Right. No, they just supply. They Yeah. 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 Baby greens, carrots, radicchio. Beets. But they do like large quantities of very few crops. Yes. <laughs> yes. So, so Annie also pointed out that the quantity that we could do on Kentucky Street was way less than the quantity that Compostela can do. Um, and Nora pointed out that they can do it better than we could, which is very true. So it just made sense um, when we were trying to scale up our farm share to outsource all of the baby greens to someone we knew could do it really well and we could grow other fun and interesting things to put in our farm share in that space that got freed up and also not worry about kind of mediocre salad greens on our end and um, also provide an outlet to our friends who we knew lost a lot of business um, because of restaurants closing because their outlets were entirely restaurant sales. Um, so it was just a mutually beneficial relationship that, yeah, I think in five years, Carl, like we probably will take back on the baby greens um, in some capacity, but for now it's a really nice thing that we don't have to worry about. Um, yeah, baby greens are very labor intensive. Yeah. Yeah, washing is so washing and processing baby greens is not something that we miss at the moment. Um okay, cool. So that's kind of that's our greenhouse. That's our greenhouse uh process for like planning for our greenhouse. It's very similar for our direct seeding overview. It's actually a, simp a little simpler because you don't have all the like tray issues. So we use just a Jang cedar. We don't use other cedars at the moment. And again, we have our, our week that we're starting. So we start this much later. We started the greenhouse in July, but we start the direct seeding in August because it's usually shorter days to maturity from seed to harvest for things that go directly in the ground, um, at least the way that we do it. And um, again, we think about some of the, these in bed details, like how many rows per bed. This actually is six rows for not brazing, but for everything on the West Bank, because our beds are bigger. And then I do the same thing where I, I break up my weeks so that I can translate that into this, um, which is what everyone sees when I say, okay, who wants to seed? We have this folder with this sheet in it and you see what variety. We have a Tupperware full of seeds. 
um, how many beds, how many rows, which roller, et cetera. These are all, this is all Jang specific um, details that make sense when you are working with the Jang, but don't make sense here. Um, Carol, what was that note about removing a felt pad that was well, all the way on the right side? Yes. So that is a, that's a Jang note. Um, there's like a little felt pad that guides seeds down to the, like the foot of the hopper. And I was reading some things, this is for beets. Yeah, we've actually stopped direct seeding beets because we had such bad germination. Um, I might try it again, but one of the notes that I saw was that some people remove that felt pad to create more, like less friction because the beets are a bigger seed. So it's kind of, it's just a jang, like a cedar specific note um, okay. that I learned that I'm not sure made much of a difference for us, but um, anyway, so, so then how do you, so once you just, yeah, so maybe Annie actually wants to talk about our seed order. So now when you like figure out what do you want to grow, how much one in there and all that good stuff, then you kind of have to translate that into, okay, how many seeds should I buy to do that? Um, this is where my brain kind of like turns in on itself. Yeah, totally short circuits. Um, I love math, but I don't love Excel formulas. So, where, what? J, here. I call them I. Why is this not a formula? Doesn't it seem like it should be a formula? Oh, you know, this is just, this is a. No, this is transplanted stuff. So this is just based on, on trays. Um, total seed needs, this is a formula. Okay, so we'll just walk through this for a few minutes. So first we do a seed inventory where we figure out what do we already have because we usually have seeds left over. Um, there are some things that, so this, this seed inventory happened in like early July. Um, Nora actually did it because Annie and I left for summer break. So Nora just kind of like counted and counted stuff that made sense to count or weighed stuff and estimated based on, you know, how many seeds the company says are in the packet at a certain weight and how much weight is left. Um, so I, I like to use up the seed we have. Um, to, you know, seed does go bad. Um, a lot of types of seed will last for many years, but some of it you really want to use within a year. So um, Johnny's in particular does a pelleted seed, which is a, a clay coating over the seed that helps with moisture retention and even germination. And so pretty much all of our lettuce, especially because I don't know if anyone has ever planted straight lettuce seed, but lettuce seed is just like very, very fine and very light and very tedious to plant. But planting a pelleted lettuce seed is a dream. You just pop this little nugget right into the, the plug and it's just, it goes very fast. And germination is usually pretty good. Uh, it is more expensive than the bare seed, but I think the labor saving is worth it. But the pelleted seed only lasts for a year and it really only lasts for a year. Like we've seen issues, I feel like even at 10, 11 months, Nora with just really crappy germination. So I'd say maybe our climate is less hospitable even, um, even keeping it in our closet, at, in our house, our closet gets hot and it gets cold. So I, like I want to use it within like six to eight months. Um, so I'm always kind of like checking in on how much seed do we have. I'd rather under order than over order. You do get bulk discounts when you order more seed, but 
I feel like if you're gonna if that seed is just gonna go bad anyway, it's it's not really worth it. So I this is one of also one of the uh, lean farming principles that has been all the buzz around town the last few years is like um, not not over ordering supplies because you can or because to like save a little bit because storage is a cost um, and a lot of that stuff ends up getting forgotten about or going bad anyway but that's a whole other conversation but anyway like like I, I suggest get the seed quantity that you know you'll use in the next six months. Um, that's kind of our philosophy. Like I'm constantly, I'm also always ordering new things from seed companies or, you know, for because the crop plan is always changing, I know I'm always going to have an opportunity to tack on some more seeds if I need to. Um, so this is our, we have our have column. We have our, let's try it. Let's get away from lettuce. Think about something else more exciting, like spinach. No, spinach isn't exciting because it doesn't do well for us. I don't know, what's exciting? Okay, salad, salad radish is kind of fun because radish seeds do kind of last forever. And we just, I don't know why, but we just have so many radish seeds and they're all, they've all fallen out of their packets and they're all just in a giant Ziploc bag. And I think we're almost done with them, but, but radish is something that like, we're constantly seeding radish. We seed radish every two weeks from August until May, basically. Um, so I know I'm not, but even knowing that I'm still not gonna buy like, like 20 pounds of radish seed because I, our varieties might change. I might, you know, discover something else. So I, I buy like a pound at a time, but we know we're doing one succession every two weeks. So 10 successions of one bed each. So that's a total of 10 beds for our fall season, which we've just finished. Or maybe we'll see radish next week. That'll be our last seeding. Um, rows per bed. I don't know why this isn't here. We'll do six rows per bed, 50 feet. I think, oh, I didn't fill this in because we have enough radish seed and I didn't actually need to order more, but so seeds per foot. This is a fun one for a direct seeded crop. Um, this is kind of an estimate too. So you just kind of have to think about like a foot of space. If you're not, if you're not transplanting your crop and you, you, so you don't know already that it's going to be four row a foot or four row six inches. Well, this number is going to, is going to, right. So Annie asked, isn't, doesn't, isn't this just determined by the Jang? But you still have to pick which settings on the Jang you're going to use for these crops and you will do that based on how many seeds per foot you want to drop. Or you can cheat like I did and just look at how, what roller, what settings other people use for the Jang. So you don't have to figure it out yourself, um, which is what we did. And I, I recommend that. But if you want to get really precise, you can do your own like seed tests and stuff like that. So yeah, Christian. The brush. So what, what the first question was, where do you find, where do you get that? Okay. So Christian was asking, where do you get the information about what other people use, what other settings people use for the Jang seeder? And does the amount of seeds drop per foot correlate to the brush height on the Jang, which is um, a little brush that does regulate how much seed goes into the roller that drops the seed. Um, the answer to your second question about the brush, that is part of it. And then the roller itself, which roller setting you choose, the which actual 
um, mechanism for dropping the seed. It has different hole sizes, so that also affects how much seed gets dropped. Um, that's why we're always kind of tweaking the brush because we were noticing that our turnip seed was coming out maybe a little heavy. So that's why we put it down a little lower. That can be one pretty easy way to tweak it, but if you're wildly off, then you might just need to change your roller. Um, where I learned, where the, the Jang settings that I use came from Ben Hartman, who is a farmer in Indiana. He wrote, he wrote the Lean Farm Guide to Building Vegetables, which I think is his second book. His first book was The Lean Farm. And the Lean Farm Guide to Growing Vegetables has a lot of this really good info in it, which I think you can also find just online, looking up like, like, like Johnny's Seed Company also has recommended rollers for which crops. But some of those crops have multiple roller recommendations and they don't really explain like why they would have like four different recommendations for beets. So I'm always trying to find a farm that grows in a, in a style that I am, am trying to like emulate in a way or that feels relatively comparable to what we're doing and see what, what are they using. And so Ben Hartman is, is that farmer for me in a lot of ways. And I think for a lot of, kind of small intensive growers, because I think a lot of times when, um, when recommendations come from the manufacturer or from the seed company, they're not always thinking of the like more intensive growers. And so for me, I'm always kind of like tweaking it or trying to compare it to what other people are doing in real time, because a lot of them have already tweaked it to a point where I can just steal that info. I mean, not steal because they're happy to share it, but um, but there's a lot of good info out there. But I would say just try to find whoever is the most comparable to what you're trying to do, and then that's usually pretty accurate. Um, so we got a formula. Ooh, exciting. Okay, so this is this their formula? Yeah, total seed. Yeah, but, uh, but I have to put seeds per foot. So seeds per foot is like, so for direct, it's more straightforward with transplants, but for direct seeded crops, it's kind of like how much space do you need in between each radish? You know, if you, if you think about a foot in a row of radish, like how many radishes could fit in there? Uh, so I've, I've landed on 20 as like, sure. I, I think it's actually way less than what happens. But so any Annie thinks 20 seems like a lot. I think we're probably dropping more like 30. So 20 seeds per foot is how many seeds per inch? It's one and two thirds seeds per inch. Right? Yeah, so so another way to look at it is it's almost two seeds almost a seed every half inch. Um, when you think about thinning, which is something that we don't do, thank God, but something that Nora and I have done plenty of, Annie's done some of and thought she hated farming because of it. But it's like where you're pulling out, you're, you, know, you have these really crowded areas where seed drop and you have to like pull out plants to make room for, for other ones to grow. Um, and then you have this guide of like how many, how much space do we need in between? So we might go, okay, we're thinning radish. So we want like two fingers between each radish or like one finger between each radish. In not thinning, I feel like I've learned that plants will, will grow, they'll just find space for the most part. Like we certainly like, we just, you know, cleared that last bed of radish and we had a lot of plants that didn't really grow in radishes. But think of the work that it would have taken to go through and pull those out before we harvest it, instead of just pulling them out as we harvest. It's just way less work to not thin. No, because we still got plenty of nice radishes. It's just, it's a waste of seed, yes, but radish seed is pretty cheap. Um, so you kind of like, 
ideally we won't have any discarded plants and we will, will be maximizing the space. So your seeds per foot is like trying to find that sweet spot. I don't know that any one farmer has perfected growing, like maximizing the space without having a thin and without having like any plants that you're tossing into the aisle because they didn't develop into a radish or whatever. Um, I think that's kind of an impossible goal. It's also so dependent on like other factors, you know, the contours of the bed make a difference. Did it rain makes a difference, you know, windbreak. It's just like 20 is kind of what I've settled on. I don't even know if 20 is what we drop, but 20 is what I use for most of our direct seeded crops that are small seeds um, to estimate how much seed we need to buy, not actually how much seed we're dropping. And I feel like that works out fairly well. So if we put 20 in here and then we copy this, that means we need 6,000 seeds per bed which means that we need 6,000 seeds per succession because we're only doing one bed per succession, which means that for this season, 10 successions, we need 60,000 seeds. So imagine we don't have enough radish seed. That means we need to buy 60,000 seeds to make sure that we're gonna have enough. Yeah, or if we had 10,000 radish seeds, which Nora diligently counted each one, then we know we need 50,000. So if you look at, so then what I would do, which you all could do in your catalog is you find radishes. So I'm gonna to go to Johnny's website and see what kind of quantities our radishes come in. So when I, what we grow, we grow shunkyo radish, one of our varieties. Beautiful long radishes. So they sell them in weight quantity. So we need what? We need 60,000 seeds. And what do they say? They say that a pound averages 53,900 seeds. Cool. So let's get a pound. Great. Done. Um, sometimes you have to do some really fun math because uh, Fedco, which is a popular seed company in Maine that a lot of New England growers really like, um, they measure everything in grams. So there's a lot of fun conversion that happens there. But anyway, uh -oh. how do I get? I just want to move this. Oh, there we go. Okay. So let's see. Total seed to buy. We're going to uh, we're gonna say 60,000. So let's see. If we're just growing Shunkyo, then I'm put Shunkyo source from Johnny's. One pound. We'll look at 53,900. Cool, we'll have 6,100 seeds left over. But this is when I actually discover that we go through a pound of seed like in four weeks, in four successions instead of 10. So that's when I realized mm, we're probably dropping more like 40 seeds per foot. But I don't really bother changing it because again, that's okay. Maybe I want to change varieties. Maybe I've discovered in four successions that Shunkyo is actually kind of crap. And I want to try cherry red radish instead. Um, so again, I feel like it's good enough. It gets us started and then we kind of tweak as we go. Um, the price per unit, what was it? Like $103.50 or something. We'll call that. Uh, we just need to get one pound. So the total price is 103.50, blah, blah, blah. And then there are any notes in here. I, don't, I haven't made any notes. So, so I've done that with all of our crops and 
And wow, we don't actually have to spend that much on seed. Mostly just radish seed. Um, so that is, that is basically the start to finish process that we go through for each crop that we grow. Um, does anyone have any questions? No. So Kyle, Kyle's asking, is that an accurate approximation of our seed price for the fall? Um, let me see. So that was that minus the radish. So actually it was like $400. I mean, no and yes, that was like, that was our actual price for getting us started with the fall back in August. Like I placed this seed order um, in like July or August. And I've probably placed like three or four other orders of about two to $300 each. Um, we also had a, a fair amount of seed. I would say it's getting started Seed is going to be a significant upfront expense getting started, especially if you're on any kind of significant amount of space. Like on Kentucky Street, um, let me see. Actually, I'm going to try and find. The crop plan. for spring of 2018, which was our first growing season. But throwback, seed order, what did we, okay, so our total seed order was for 467.06, and that was for our the spring season, which was January, to June on a half acre of growing things that mostly don't cost a lot of money to grow. So plenty of radishes in here too. Um, plenty of baby greens, which you can buy a lot of seed, a large quantity of seed, but you're gonna use a large quantity because you know that's probably like 60 seeds per foot. Um, seeding those, you know, kind of little salad mixes, but that, that's a pretty, like $500 per half acre per half year. That feels about right for, our, for what we've seen, you know, and then we spent about another $400 this fall with already having a lot of seed. We're growing on more than a half acre, but it also was only the first step in what proved to be many more seed orders this fall. And it's kind of every few months we're placing seed orders. Like I just placed one yesterday um, for more Salanova, which is our lettuce seed. Um, uh, good. Okay, so Kyle said, and none of this includes microgreens. Uh, no, none of this includes microgreens. Microgreens is just that we get from from a true leaf seed mostly. We do get our pea shoot seeds from Johnny's. And that's just simpler because we're just buying huge bags of seed. Um, actually radish microgreen seeds are way cheaper than radish radish seeds, but they do grow beautiful radishes. Um, I think they just don't want you to know that you can grow radishes from them because the seed is so cheap because you couldn't, we couldn't buy, you know, 50 pounds of radish seed, you know, one pound was $100. 50 pounds is probably not $5,000, but it's probably like $2,000. So it would just be insane to, to grow microgreens from actual like radish radish seeds. So they, they cheapen the microgreens, but they, we've accidentally grown very beautiful radishes from old microgreen seed. And we're like, huh. What? Uh, 
Um, uh, Christian asked if, is there any reason not to do that? Like, do they, are there fewer varieties or what? Just to use radish microgreens. Um, there are not as many varieties, but there's no, there's no reason that I can think of not to do it. We'll like, I'll probably do it again. I like to throw them in the mix every now and then. I mean, radish seed is not like, we're not spending so much more on radish seed because we're not using that much of it when we grow radishes. So it's like, it's, it's tempting to just use the microgreens, but yeah, we don't get all the varieties we like. Um, okay, cool. So now I want to take like a 15 minute break and have everyone kind of sift through if you have catalogs, which people in person have catalogs. Um, do people on the Zoom want to participate by picking a crop? Let's see. Where are, where are people on Zoom? I have, uh, I have the Johnny's website open in another tab with you guys. So I've been kind of like browsing things as we go along. Cool. Um, so what's, what's the goal of picking a crop here? What are we trying to do? Okay, so my thought was that now I have this empty crop plan. So my thought was that people could go through and pick a variety of a certain category of a crop. And then we could kind of go through and, and mock crop plan for at least some of them. Um, so Michael, do you want to pick a salad green? Sure, or I'll do this, this muir lettuce, this heat resistant muir. Well, we're going to, we're going to take a break so you can don't, don't, no spoilers. No. <laughs> tell me, tell me in, in 10, 15 minutes. Gotcha. Or nor is a good choice, but see, but browse some other ones and see if there's anything else that looks good. Okay. Um, okay, so you're gonna do a salad green. Christian, do you wanna do a cooking green? So something that, uh, something fun and, and bunchable maybe, or just, or really anything. Um, let's see, how many people do we have? There are three more people at Roots. Chelsea, do you want to pick a root? So something fun. Nora, do you want to pick a cucurbit? Um, Kyle, you're gonna. Do you want to pick a random crop? Doesn't well. Well, some so so something that doesn't fit into the other categories like a like okra or fennel or. Oh, uh, actually, yeah, let's pick those. That's not on here. Uh, yeah, just kidding, not dealer's choice. Yeah, I do you want to pick a nightshade? It's like an eggplant or pepper. Don't do tomatoes, I'm not gonna get into tomatoes because we're not gonna grow them and they're, they're in a pain. Um, uh, does, everyone, does everyone pick their crop? You still working, Kyle? You're not going to be first, so you can move a little bit. Um, also, I, I forgot to mention this Louisiana, oh, this LSU planting guide that I gave y'all. Michael, you can get this online. Just if you look up like LSU vegetable planting guide. I have it. This is kind of like the rough. So this, this has this cultural recommendations page. This has the recommendations for when you should plant what in Louisiana. And we're in South Louisiana, we're South of the lake, so we're warmer. So I kind of go two weeks sooner. And some of this like, like, uh, like Chinese cabbage, for instance, it's like our like bok choys and Napa cabbages. That says you stop planting in October, pick up again in January, but I just, we just go right through you know, and that's been fine. So like Carl was talking a little bit about this, about how they're tweaking this guide to be a little more accurate. We're all very excited about that. Um, 
but this is a really good guide. Like when Annie and I first moved down here and had no idea how to adapt a Massachusetts planting calendar to Louisiana, this is just a really good guide to be like, oh, okay, like we plant peas in April, but you can plant peas here, English peas, not Southern peas, because they have very different seasons. Oh, okay, you plant those like fall through March or through February. Um, so it, it it's just a good reference point, basically is what I'm saying. I wouldn't, I wouldn't use these dates exactly. I would also push the boundaries a little. We've got climate change. We are also in the Southern part of the state. We have a little leeway there, but anyway. Okay, so Michael, what did you pick? Muir? Okay, shockingly, I got the Muir lettuce. Surprise, surprise. Um, and I got information on both the traditional seeds and also the pelleted seeds. Okay, cool. So why did you pick Muir? Uh, heat resistance, mainly, and I've grown up before. Cool. Muir is one that we have been growing this fall. So great choice. Um, it's done medium to bad for us. Oh. <laughs> what, what, what do you think, Nora? Yeah. So what's the, what's the criticism there? Um, Muir I think we, it just hasn't done that great for us on Kentucky Street, but it, you know, probably for a variety of reasons, like while it, it is more heat resistant, I think it still just like did not love the August, September weather. Mm -hmm. It didn't really thrive, but nothing that, like it, I don't know, do you think it did any better than the other lettuces? I mean, I think Yeah. Right. It's not disease resistant. Yeah. Yeah. Nora was pointing out that heat resistance probably doesn't apply to our kind of heat. Um, right. Well, I think it's it is definitely good to try all resistant varieties, and that's kind of our philosophy. But they do tend to still struggle in the like real heat heat. Um, so, but let's go with it. Let's try it. You know. Sure. Um, I do before. Well, I have sort of like a big question regarding all of this, and specifically to do with heat. But we can go through this first, and maybe come back to it. Okay. Um, so, okay, so what, so how many beds do you want to do per succession? Do you want to grow, do you want to grow a lot of lettuce or do you want to just like have, have it all the time? I'm, I'm imagining one bed per succession, um, right, because I'm, I'm picturing sort of a smaller growing space, so, so one 50 foot bed per succession so that I can have more space for other things. Great. And uh, so, and yeah. What do you think on frequency? So the fr the frequency would be once a week, right? It could or be it could be once a week. I don't know that you would. We we do twice or we do once every two weeks because okay. that's you know kind of enough for us. But okay. if you focus on lettuce you could definitely do once a week a lot of growers do that okay um yeah i guess i was just thinking that with the days to maturity being kind of short it would be but let's let's say that no let's say once every other week and then potentially harvesting just a half a bed at a time yeah that's <laughs> half a bed each week for harvest that's kind of what <clears throat> that's kind of what we do um for, yeah, for space reasons and also other reasons. Um, so this is going into the spring. So we like we could do this. So our first greenhouse seeding week 
is not as big of a question mark as our last greenhouse seeding week, since it's going to be getting hotter. So right. I'll say now for you know what's I'll say twelve twenty one could be our first week of our first seeding, um, which would mean that our four weeks out would be our uh, first planting. So let's see. One, two, three, four. So we can predict January 18. Um, we're not going to do that. So when do you think we should do our last greenhouse seeding week? Like when, when do you all think it would be the weather would still be conducive to growing lettuce? even the heat resistant kind here. I think probably no more than <laughs> end of March. March really cynical. Um, well, we're gonna push it a little more than March. So, well, so let's work backwards. Like when do you think would be the realistic like last time we, we could be harvesting lettuce? Like. What we, we could do is look at our records. We could look at our like Harvey records, which is our farm share management, or we could look at our square records for when we went to markets. And we could see when is the last week that we had lettuce. Um, if you're just starting out though, you could estimate, you could use the Louisiana vegetable planting guide. Lettuce, according to LSU, should not be should not be planted past January 31st. And this I'm assuming is from direct seeded. So that means that our last, according to LSU, our last greenhouse seeding should be on January 31st. But we're not gonna listen to LSU. Carl's shaking his head, don't listen to LSU. So we're gonna add at least a month to that, probably two. So I think what we, we've been trying to push lettuce to the brink for all of our growing seasons and, and our last plantings are never that great, but we still do it because we get something off of it. Um, let's see what we've done in the past in our actual crop plan. Well, this was from last year. Let's see what we did. Okay. Let's see what we did in our first crop plan. So this is, this is what we actually predicted for lettuce. Oh, we just did three plantings. Yeah, so we really stuck to the LSU guide in that first season. We only did, we did, we planted lettuce every week for three weeks, starting on February 15th, which means that we started seeding it on January 15th. So then we stopped. Yeah, we only went a week beyond the LSU guide. But as we've matured, we've discovered that we can go even beyond that. So let's say if we see it at the end of March, then it'll be ready to go in the ground at the end of April. What's the days to maturity on year? You should be able to find it. On, uh, on Johnny's. It was, yeah, I just had it pulled up. Huh? 50 days. You have it there. Okay, so Annie, Annie has it in the catalog. She says it's 50 days, but does it say from transplanting or from direct seeding? Okay, so that to me is from direct seeding, 50 days for a lettuce. They, I, they often will do direct seeded days to maturity for things like lettuce, because a lot of growers will direct seed lettuce. Um, so then they say take off. They say to take off about two weeks for, I. I'm pretty sure, let me actually just look at this. I'm pretty sure I've said like 35 days for, uh, for muir. Okay, this is saying 50 days to maturity 
for head lettuce um, from yeah. direct seeding? So I, from experience and just because we know that we're going to be transplanting it, we take some days off of that. This 38 days from transplant estimate is for, it's kind of an average of all of the bigger head lettuces that we've grown. Your was one of them. So I, it's usually like, depending on the time of year, like 30 to 35 to 40 days, depending on variety. So let's just say 35 from your, it's also going to be our grow. We're going to be growing a lot faster. Um, because we're gonna be in the spring, it's gonna be beautiful. April is amazing. Everything grows super fast. The weather is perfect. So 35 is probably a decent average estimate. Um, so let's say we want lettuce, okay, mid-May. That's our goal. Can we get lettuce to grow until mid-May? If we're gonna do it with anything, it's gonna be with Muir because it's the most heat resistant variety that we can find of all of our catalogs. So Muir, we've got going till mid-May. What's 35 days back from like May 15th or whatever? Like, whatever, uh, like the 10th of April? Or let's say May 17th, because that's a Monday. I, I like to just use Monday as like my date okay so one two three April 19. that's 28 days right so another seven days april 12th so april 12th is our the week of our last planting which means the week of our last greenhouse seeding would be four weeks prior to that so March 12th, roughly, but let's just do it actual. So we've got one, two, three, four. So March 15th is going to be our would last you, lettuce seeding in the greenhouse. Right. Would you not shorten the days in the greenhouse, being that it's a warmer month than two, like in the spring like that? Does it still need four weeks in the greenhouse? Um, Probably not, but I don't, but you could, you could definitely shorten it if you want to be more accurate, but this is another one of those things where I kind of just use a standard for the whole year. Like right now, stuff is probably in the greenhouse for five weeks, maybe six in some cases, it's in the shady corner. Yeah. But. You just sort of average it for the sake of simplicity. Average it, or it's like okay. stuff stuff usually has like a buffer of a week in the greenhouse where like it might be really ready but we might not be able to have bed space for it until the following week so I feel like after four weeks it's it's ready if it's half ready after three weeks we might still be able to get it in after four weeks um so I just use that as like my general estimate other growers who are better at crop planning probably have more detailed like they probably can get it down to like per crop, like how long it takes and per variety. But our systems just aren't standardized yet to that point. Um, okay, cool. So that means how many successions are we doing between January 18th and March 15th? So let's actually say, let's say January 13th. So one, two, Three, four, five, six, seven. No, this is 2020, but I think it's eight. <laughs> I was looking at the wrong calendar, but we'll go with eight. I got eight, yeah. Eight, okay, great. Cool. All right, so your lettuce, that's kind of our overview. All right, we're going to hold off on you, Michael. Christian, what do you got for cooking greens? Hansai Thai? Okay, all right. 
Okay, Han Sai Tai. Cool. All right. Well, I've never grown Han Sai Tai before. Are you looking at the Johnny's catalog? Okay. Let me, I'm just going to bring it up on the. Now, why did you pick Han Sai Tai? Okay, cool. So Christian likes that it's purple and also it seems like it would have a long, a long range of, uh, of time down here. So yeah, I like the sound of that. Never grown that. So let's see. Hansai. T-S-A. Oh, Hansai, like, like dish. Or vegetable. Vegetable. Sai means dish and vegetable in uh, Mandarin. It used to be the name of Aaron's pop-up. All right. So, okay. So, how many how many beds do you think we want to grow of Han Sai Tai? Two. All right. Cool. Cool. Christian wants to grow a lot of Han Sai Tai. <laughs> Flood, yes, flood the market. This is great. I mean, this is something that people probably haven't heard a lot about, but it's similar enough. It said it had a, a, like a mustardy flavor. So you can kind of get people who like mustard greens to try it. Um, yeah, it looks like it's probably pretty similar to Choi Sum with the flowering kind of tender stalks. All right, cool. So what's our planting frequency? Every two weeks? Well, I like, I like every two weeks as a standard. Um, okay, so we're not gonna, I think, well, okay. So you tell me, would you direct seed this or would you transplant this? Okay, Christian says direct seed. I have to agree. I think this is a, a good one to be direct seeding. So um, again, we are right in the middle of the cooler growing season. So I think we could just put it right in the ground like next week if we wanted to. Um, fall succession, we're not gonna worry about. So when, when could we grow this until, do you think? Around March? Okay, so. Yeah, this is, yeah, so you can see where you kind of have to tweak your understanding because Johnny says best yields when sown June through October. Definitely not talking about here. Um, definitely talking about like Northern Maine. Um, yeah, so midsummer through winter for us, that's probably, that probably is us, a milder area in terms of what they're re referencing. So, yeah, I think March March seems like a great call. It's safe. You can kind of, uh, it doesn't say on here. So Johnny's also has these kind of um, fun little um, lo like markers under crops. Like if this was a particularly heat, heat tolerant crop, it would have a little sun, but I'm not seeing a sun. So March is, is safe, 37 days to maturity, awesome. Let's see, so that's so week of last green of last greenhouse heating, that's week of last planting. We'll call that March 15th or whatever day that gets us to. Is that can someone figure out, Annie? Can you figure out if that's on the every two week cycle or if it's gonna be like March 8th or 22nd? Never mind. I want you to figure out how many successions it is when you're planting two beds every two weeks from December 21st to roughly the middle of March. And then figure out which day. Yeah. 
All right, cool. So I'm excited about this Han Sai Tai. All right, we're gonna skip herbs because those are more complicated. Not that much, but slightly. All right, Chelsea, that's seven. And does it end up at March 15th or? Okay, so it's seven spring success. It helps to have someone who can do calendar math for you. All right, Chelsea, what do you think about roots? Whoa, okay. Okay, Chelsea is interested in horseradish, which I might, let's see, let's see, we might, okay, I might be up for this. This is a, an unconventional. Okay, so I might have to table the horseradish because it's a pretty different crop. Something that you would probably just wanna plant once because it's a perennial. So you'd probably just have a permanent spot for it. Um, oh, rutabagas we can do. Okay. Horseradish is cool though. I do, I wanna plant horseradish, but you gotta figure out where. All right. So Chelsea wants to do rutabaga. And are you, are you in Johnny's or are you in high mowing? All right, cool. So which variety of rutabaga are you into? Laurentian. Cool. Okay. So why why did you pick Laurentian? Cool. Okay. So Chelsea likes that it's sweet and mild, and the flavor sounds pretty good. Okay. So this is a this is a fun one to think about because. A ruta, rutabagas can be storage crops where you can just kind of like grow a bunch all at once and then keep them in the cooler for a while. That's mostly how they're grown in the north. People will seed them in the summertime. They'll mature in like October and then people will just like harvest them and, and distribute them through the winter. Um, down here, we could grow successions of them if we wanted to and kind of like probably bunch them and like hand them out. I've, I haven't seen a lot of people grow rutabagas down here, but you've seen them in, more in Mississippi. Oh, really? Okay, so did you, so Chelsea said that so so did you, when you grew them at home growing up, did you grow them? Like, did you constantly plant them and grow them? Okay, so you were doing a lot of successions. Okay, cool. So we'll, we'll think of it as successions then. Um, okay, so how many beds do you want to grow per succession? Two beds, we're going to be a rutabaga, hansai tai, and lettuce farm. Okay, how often do you want to seed them? So this is something where you can also think about doing like fewer successions because they do have that storage quality to them. So it's like, maybe you don't wanna grow all of them all at once, but maybe you wanna grow, you don't need to grow them as frequently as we grow something like lettuce that's really perishable. So you could grow enough to store for like a month and then your next crops are coming on in a month. So you don't have to have all that storage space, which is also a concern, you know, if you want to grow a lot of storage crops, but maybe you do like chunks of successions instead of like rapid fire successions. Um, but you could, you could do either, but it's like something that you have a little more flexibility with, with a, a crop like rutabaga. I think every two weeks would be, would be fine but I think you could also get away with like every month, like every four weeks. So if, especially with something like two beds every four weeks, that would give you a nice amount of rutabaga. It's probably not gonna be the most popular crop, but there's always gonna be some people who are excited about it. So I feel like you can ease up on it a little bit if you either A, don't want 
the work of seating it every two weeks or don't want um, or don't have space for it all, you know, every two weeks. So, for, so if it were me, I might start with every four weeks. And then you can also tell like, wow, I'm running out of rutabagas so fast, people love them. Then you can start upping into every four weeks, which is what we've actually done with a lot of crops, like, like uh, hawker eye turnips, purple top turnips, um, radishes, honestly, like we didn't start out seeding as many radishes, but we keep selling them, so. Yes, yeah, exactly. So when we go through and kind of like top harvest them, we just put them in the cooler and then we just pull them out every farm share, distribute what we need, put them back in the cooler and they'll last for months, honestly. It's really just a space issue for us. Like we just can't fill our cooler with, veg with root veggies. Um, when we have a barn, we can have more cooler space and we can grow tons of root veggies and just have them in storage. And a lot of growers in the South, I've heard of starting to do that for summer stuff actually. So they'll, you know, if they want to sell stuff over the summer, but you can't really grow stuff very easily, especially root crops like beets, carrots, rutabaga, you just grow a ton of it in the spring, store it and distribute it throughout the summer. Um, okay, so do you think this is a greenhouse crop or a tr or jang crop? Do you think it's a, are we going to transplant it or are we going to direct seed it? Okay. Yeah, I think that, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, direct seed or rutabaga. Usually something that's really dense like that gets direct seeded. And again, we're right in the middle of its growing season. So we could just seed it in the ground next week if we wanted to. Um, fall successions, we're not gonna worry about. Okay, so when, when should we stop growing rutabaga? Do you think? We've got rutabaga going until Rutabaga is a typically a cooler season crop. It takes a while to mature, so 95 days to maturity. So that's three months. So if we seed it uh, next week, it'll be ready the end of March. So I think, I think that leaves us with two successions because then we our next succession, if we're doing four weeks, would get us to the end of April. And I feel like trying to push it to the end of May, you might get some real weird looking rutabaga. The heat I think is gonna, also the pest pressure I'm imagining would be pretty heavy by that point. Uh, Christian is asking if the heat would, would cause it to bolt. Um, yes, that's probably one way the heat would affect it. The flavor probably would also be kind of weird and gross if you get it really hot. And it might just not, right? It might just stunt out, get pests all over it, get diseased. Yeah, so Chelsea said that they suggest floating row cover. Definitely a great tool for pest pressure. Um, we use netting because floating row cover adds, well, I mean, netting is a kind of floating row cover, um, but netting does not add any temperature. A lot of growers up north can add a, 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 like the fabric that Christian and I used to cover our transplants the other day, and Nora has used a little bit on Kentucky Street. That does add a little temperature protection, which we are, we're not gonna need in the, in the spring, and we're not, definitely not gonna need it for rutabaga which doesn't mind cooler weather. So, so I feel like two spring successions is good. If you can also always be like, hmm, that doesn't feel like enough rutabaga. Maybe like in your second succession, if there's space, you'll seed four beds of rutabaga, knowing that 
you probably wouldn't be wise to try and squeeze one more succession in, but maybe you want a little more. So you can you can always kind of tweak, especially with something like rutabaga, where you have that that storage flexibility. Um, so the week of our last planting, let's see, is going to be like January twenty first or whatever Monday equivalent that is. Um, cool. Okay. I like the looks of our farm. All right, what do you got, Nora? <laughs> Whoa, okay, wait. Okay, hi, hi mowing. Okay, so, wait, wait, boothy? Oh, boothy, boothy. Oh yeah, boothy blonde, I've never heard of this. Wow, that is blonde. Mmm, <laughs> boothy. Booth bay. All right, cool. So we've got Boothby, Boothby Blonde Cucumber, um, which looks looks tasty. Why, why did you pick it? Uh, yeah, it's, I'm glad I'm not there. Yeah, it's a little bit of a little bit Okay, so we got some taste. Taste awards on Boothby Blonde, an unusual variety, definitely would, would make us stand out. <laughs> All right, so cucumber, see so cucumbers is a fun one to think about for beds per succession, really any cucumber beds because they take up a lot of space. So we most likely are gonna want more than one bed per succession. So how many, what do you think, Nora? Hmm. Okay. Okay. Cool. So yeah, that's so maybe this is one of many varieties of cucumber that we're planting. And this one will just do two beds, kind of feel it out. Yeah, it's it's usually a good idea to not jump in full full on with a new variety. It's good to kind of try it like rely on your kind of heavy hitters, known entities, and then throw in some fun experiments along the way and and ramp it up if the uh, if people like it and if it does well. Um, okay, so how often should we see this booth be blonde cucumber? Every two weeks? I think that works. That's that's what our standard for cucurbits in the springtime. Okay, so week of first greenhouse seeding. So this is a fun one. So it's a little too cold right now. For cucumbers. They're not going to do so hot if we put them in the ground now or even a month from now. So when, if you look at the planting guide, they suggest that cucumbers could be in the ground starting March 1st. I like to give us like a, a two week sooner date. Um, although last year we did that and our first round got frost damage, that early March uh, Mardi Gras freeze that we got. But if we didn't get that, we would have had early cucumbers. So if we aim for, if we aim for like mid-February, what's our first greenhouse seeding date? Oh, interesting. Okay. So that, how many days is it? Fifty-eight. The little leaf is a little, it's always a week later than our squash and zucchini. Um, 
but that's also from direct seeding. So we can take a little bit off for transplanting. So you take, I usually take about two or three weeks off. So let's see, it's 63 days, 63 days from trans, from seeding. So from transplant, let's call that like 40 days from transplant. So we might, we might want, but so in this, in this case, our constraint is what's the earliest we can put it in the ground, which won't change because of days to maturity. So this, we would just know if we select it, we'll just have to wait a little bit longer to get this variety instead of pushing up the greenhouse schedule because we don't want to put it in the ground any sooner, if that makes sense. So I think on the front end, we're still going to be locked into that kind of like mid-February transplant date, which would then result in like a mid-January greenhouse date. Um, so what's that like? January. We did like the, yeah. last, the last Monday of February is the 22nd. And then four weeks before that, are you doing four weeks? Yeah. Last time, four weeks before that would be the January 25th. January 25th. Okay. So that would be February 22nd. Okay. So I feel like I feel pretty, that might be risky if we get a late cold spell, but if we don't, then I, I feel good about that. And we can continue our succession. So when's, what's the last time that we think we want cukes into the ground or, or harvest? Mid to late April. So yeah, because we've got Well, they on the West Bank they got hit with that a lot of rain last spring, so they got gross. They, I mean, theoretically they should be able to go into June. So mid May would be like our last. I think mid May. Well, with this variety, since it's going to be forty days from transplant, I'd say if we want to try to be wrapping up. So also our harvest window on cucumbers is what, like three weeks minimum if conditions are right. If conditions are really right, it could be like six weeks. So I might back that up even a little more just to give us time to like ease into summer so that we're not harvesting cucumbers in, uh, in July. So if we aim to have, maybe if we aim to have it ready by early June, then I think I think you're at what you originally said, like late April. I think that makes makes sense with this variety. Yeah, because cucumbers is some not something where you would like just harvest it all and and be out of the ground. Then we have more even more of a window where once it's ready we're going to still be dealing with it for a while. Um, cool, so week of glass greenhouse seeding would be, what did I say? Late April. So how many successions is that? From January 25th to April. Yeah, every other week. Oh wait, no, that's the last planting. Not the last. So when's our last greenhouse seeding if the last planting is late April? And how many successions is that? Wow, so you back it up. 
So back it up about a month for the last greenhouse seeding. March 29th, okay. I think it's five. Five successions? Is that right? No, that's right. That seems about right. Yeah, and we can adjust that. So it's, we're on the two week schedule. We can push it a week or pull it back a week if we want. Or, or push, you know, push January 25th to January 18th, maybe, and then just hold on to this in the greenhouse if it's um, So we have, you know, we can, you can always kind of tweak it to keep your, your calendar consistent. Cool. Okay. Well, Booth be blonde. Let's, let's see how that does. All right. Carl, you got a nightshade for us? Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Um, yeah, so Kyle's asking if why why we do cucumber successions instead of just do a big cucumber planting all at once um, because they inevitably get diseased or pest attacked. So we always want a healthy succession coming down the pipe. We often, and then we will get to that point where we're just harvesting off of like five plantings or probably not all at once because the first will probably be dead by the fifth goes in. But, but um, yeah, it's kind of like for space reasons, number one, like we would need like 20 beds of cucumbers ready all at once. And then I like to spread that risk over the course of the season so that we could lose one succession, but know that uh, across the field, we have another coming on. Um, and just because those things inevitably die before we're done wanting to have them at market. Um, just knowing that our conditions aren't perfect and so they get stressed out. Same with, with like zucchini and squash. Like those things just peter out eventually. Yeah, but like ideal conditions, you'd have to like create a microclimate where you're, I mean, they probably wouldn't actually, because at some point they want to, they like live out their lifespan. I don't know. It's like the same with humans, like in ideal conditions, we can live a long time, but we're not going to live forever. Yeah. Yeah, they because they kind of hit their peak and then they can only, you know, it's like it takes a lot out of them to use up the nutrients in the soil and to, to keep flowering and to keep growing foliage. Like the more foliage they have, the more susceptible they are to disease and, and pest pressure. So it's just kind of like all factors converge to result in dead plants. But then we look to the right or left and we got fresh young plants happening. So that's why we do successions. Um, did you have a question, Nora? the more it takes. Yeah, water, yeah. Yeah, Nora's saying that like the, the bigger a plant gets, especially like a sprawling cucumber, the more work it is to like get nutrients and water out to those tendrils and those, those fruits at the like ends of those leaves. And yeah, I mean, I think that's very true. It's just like, you're, it needs more. Like bigger people need more food, takes more energy to get up in the morning when you're bigger, older. Um, I think that's that's super true. Um, all right, cool, Kyle, what you got? Do you want wine? I have three. Okay. 
<laughs> just just give me all three. We let's let's see. Well, let's let's start with one. <laughs> Beatrice Eggplant and Johnny's. Ooh, okay, it's a good looking. Nightshades are hard because they're very appealing, they're very colorful and shiny and you wanna grow all of them, but they're real pains in the ass to grow. Although eggplant is not that bad. Well, so I was thinking back to last spring, we had many of the methods that they Mm -hmm. And it seemed like it was less pressure than the plant. So like, mm -hmm. I remember, like, I remember the big time on the wall for whatever reason, I don't remember that one, but we were still able to work with the first one. I don't have any of that. Uh-huh. Yeah. The little one, yeah. So Michael Kyle was saying that uh, he was remembering last spring when we had pest pressure at different times on our small eggplant versus our big eggplant. So he picked a, a couple of sizes of eggplant to try and space out the pest pressure because you know something can always power through it. Um, and I think that was a really good observation that, um, yeah, we'll keep seeing if that plays out. Um, I, that's also, I like to grow different sizes, different varieties, just to, as like an insurance policy against, against pest pressure. Um, cool. So Beatrice is your bigger, is a bigger variety. Okay, 62 days. And does that, that's probably from uh, transplanting because they plant is often. Yeah, so this, so nightshades are not something that I give a month for in the greenhouse. Nightshades first start on in line trays where uh, on heating pads. And so line trays is a tray that has 20 lines in it. It's the same size as our 10, 20, or as our 72s and 128s, but you can put a lot more seeds in it. And that's really just to get them germinated. And so that you can, like a heat mat is only like the size of this table. So I wouldn't be able to put like 20 trays on it. So line trays allows you to put more seed concentrated in a smaller space if you need to like add that extra heat. And then what we'll do is we'll pot them up once they germinate. So you take those plants out and you put them in bigger trays. And that's a really fun spring process. Um, I like potting up. Yeah. It is fun. You don't have to do it. <laughs> um, so yeah, I kind of, what? Yeah, potting up is a big thing in flowers because flowers need a lot of extra special care. Um, but yeah, so so eight weeks is pretty is pretty much what I estimate for a greenhouse time for nightshades, uh, which is that's the only thing that I th I think of. Anything that goes in a line tray, basically, you're adding like another month or two to three weeks at least. Um, so given that, like when, when do you want to plant, when do you want to plant eggplant? Like when should eggplant go in the ground? So. Uh, uh huh. Yeah, so, yeah, so that, that's been our thought exactly. We usually aim for about March 1st to have them ready to go in the ground. And then we kind of, you know, keep an eye on the weather and make sure there aren't any cold nights in the forecast. 
Um, and then, and if there are, we can usually hang on to them until mid-March. Um, but the plants are ready. We we'll try to have them ready to go by early March. So with that, what's, so when should we put them in line trays? So pretty soon, you gotta or, order some seed. Um, so, and the thing about nightshades is, what what about successions? Um, I wouldn't, I, we haven't done successions on eggplant or peppers. Tomatoes I would do successions on because those just get immediately attacked by pests. And even with successions, they just die. So we're not gonna grow them in the field. Um, but no, eggplant and peppers can usually just get one big planting. Yeah, in my experience. Successions would be interesting, but but I feel like we're already kind of pushing, like, because we want to end in June, we don't have a lot of leeway because they take so long in the greenhouse and then they take another two months. Like they're already not really ready until May to start harvesting. So doing more successions would just kind of push our harvesting of that into the summer when we don't really want to be harvesting stuff. So I kind of like that we did the ratooning where we cut down the eggplant at the end of the spring and then we got another bumper crop off of it in the fall. Um, kind of, I want to aim to do that again, but really like we're only looking at like a six to six to eight week harvest window in May, June for our eggplant. And then they're usually pretty ready to for a break by the time we're ready for a break. And so that timing works out pretty well. And I'm sorry, Cheryl, can you just um, elaborate on what you said there where you, you cut something off? And then uh, got... Yeah, so we, we last spring we did this thing called ratooning where in at the end of the spring um, before summer break, we cut all of the eggplant plants down to about eight to 10 inches above the ground. We just left them to hang out as little stumps over the summer. And they grew back over the summer while we were on break. And by the time we got back, they had produced more fruit and we were able to harvest them for another month or so, um, which was really cool. And is something that I had been wanting to try. And that was the first time we tried it. And I, we did it with our peppers too, but our peppers were really weedy. so. That was a that didn't work out as well, but I think it could have worked well if we had been better about weed maintenance. Um, I know people will do it with okra. We just did it with our hot peppers for the winter, so we're gonna see if they come back in the spring. You can um, winter pepper pepper crops the same way, like. That's what I've read, and we just we're gonna try it. We're trying it. Cool. Yeah, so it's it's ratooning r a t o o n i n g. There's some. There's some interesting literature on it. Some, some uh, like universities have done uh, experiments with it. Um, and it worked, yeah, it worked pretty well. It was cool. cool. I'm okay. excited. I mean, instead of like clearing the bed, you just get a bonus harvest off of it when you, you know, in the fall, which is yeah. nice. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. So, so what have we determined here, Kyle? Uh... So mid March is going to be our, or no, early March is going to be our planting week, and that's basically our only planting week. So mid March or whatever Monday is closest, or early March, whatever Monday is closest to early March. March first. March first. There you go. Monday, March first, and then first greenhouse seeding. So yeah, January first is. Really, or we could probably get away with like January 8th. Probably gonna have to. Um, 
And so we're just doing the one succession. So this is not relevant and this is not relevant because it's the same as the first. Um, so we're just doing, we're not doing every week. We're, and so how many beds of Beatrice? What are our other varieties here? Hansel and Gretel, uh-huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, they are Okay, so 55 days, so we'll have a couple of uh, a week earlier. Got our first flush of eggplant. Um, cool. Okay, so it's those three. Let's check out what a Hansel and Gretel look like. The harvest. Oh, for fairy tale, the market is is great. Yeah, people love fairy tale. I have actually grown, I think Hansel. Gretel is, wh is white, yeah. Or maybe, no, we grew, I think we grew Gretel at first root. Remember the little white eggplants? I think they didn't do that that well at first root. Or we didn't grow that much, maybe we grew like a half bed. Um, but yeah, that's that makes up a nice kind of like colorful, variety box of eggplant. Um, I like that. Cool. So we're at about 10 of noon. And I feel like this is a good stopping point. Like we, you all, I mean, this, like, I feel like once you get this overview, you can easily go through and plug in, you know, you know which of these crops needs to be in the greenhouse based on what we just went through. So then you can kind of go through and plug in all of the rest of these details based on different like cultural facts about that crop, um, reading a little bit about it on the seed catalog, looking up what other growers do, um, just paying attention to what we do. Like a lot of the crop planning stuff that I've learned, I've just learned from observing what other farms I've worked on have been doing. Like what size trays do these people put this in? Like we used to grow tons of things in lots of bigger trays at first root. And then Laura talked to a, another grower in our town and they were like, oh, we grow everything in 200s because they had a tiny, tiny greenhouse and tons of field space. So it was like, Oh, uh, maybe we don't need to grow everything in the 50s. Maybe we can cut back because, you know, it's a lot of soil that goes into those trays and a lot of trays and a lot of space. So um, there's a lot of information out there is what I'm trying to say. And it's, it's all very useful. And I think just having a place to start is always a good kind of jumping off point. And also just getting, just starting your own yourself. Like you're gonna learn a lot from just like doing it. Um, and you'll be able to tweak each, each season. You know, each season we've gotten a little bit better at um, picking our varieties and uh, picking our, figuring out our calendar, trying not to have as much waste, um, but still trying to also push, push those dates to, um, to get to a point where we know, we, okay, we can have a farm share that starts in, in mid-September. We can have these crops that will be available to go into that farm share and we can have a farm share that goes till the end of May. And I feel like that's, that's kind of where we're at. Do y'all have any questions? I, I have kind of a big question actually. Um, it's really kind of about season extension and this issue of heat management. Mm -hmm. um, just, and I guess this probably matters more with a fall season 
where you're trying to start seed in like the high heat of summer. Mm -hmm. um, Cause it always seems like it's easier to add heat to a system in winter than it is to take heat away in summer. And if you're interested in having something that's small, high turnover, like baby salad greens that sells well and it's high value, like how do you manage what you can get started in like July and August when you can't like, you can't necessarily make a, a space where germinating like spinach or lettuce is gonna work. I mean, unless, the, unless there's techniques for doing that that I'm just not privy to, like shading and, and airflow and stuff like that. But like, how do you manage that? And then like, how do you balance that with sort of just doing things that you can rely on, like an eggplant where you can, you know, you can seed it in July and it'll probably be all right. Uh, um, yes. A little bit of both and just hope for the best, I mean. Yeah, definitely shade. Like uh, our greenhouse has shade cloth on it on half of it for a lot of the year so that we can always create stuff in the shade. You don't want it to be in the shade for too long though because then it gets really leggy. Um, but germination is like really the challenge, like getting it to just come up at all. Um, some people will in July and August and September, so like Ellis at Major Acre and I think Timothy and Madeline at Compostela, I think they've started putting their uh, lettuce trays in the cooler overnight to, to um, just kind of get that that like cold shock to it to wake it up. Um, I don't know if their cooler, I think they actually raised the level of their cooler to be closer to like 55 because there's no crop in there yet. So I don't know that you want to put it in a fridge, but um, if you have a cool space or like a really air conditioned room, it, so you don't actually need light to germinate. It's just as soon as things are germinated, they need light. So if you can keep an eye on stuff and you have like a super frigid room that you keep at like 60, you can germinate lettuce in there too. It's just a matter of like, do you want dirty trays in your house? I don't, so we don't do that. Right. But you could, and shade cloth is valuable. And once it's in the ground, a lot of overhead water I find has, is kind of necessary just to keep it from like wilting. Yeah. Um, and so in general, you think it's better to try and figure out a way to mitigate the heat and just grow what you want to grow rather than be like, I can't, I can't grow lettuce in August. So I'm not going to try it. To the point, yes. At some point it's not going to be worth your while to be putting all of the extra labor and expense into growing something unless you can price it in a way that reflects the true cost of that added labor. Like if people want lettuce in August, they're gonna have to pay more for it because it's gonna be a lot of work for a grower to grow it here. But otherwise they understand that like lettuce just isn't gonna be there or it's not gonna be good in August. So yeah, they grow hydroponically all year. So yeah, there's also the factor of some people are just growing hydroponically and will always have lettuce and so you might not be able to compete with those prices at the market because you put all of that extra work into it, but can't price it more than the hydroponic people. Because people don't, don't see that work when you're just standing there at a market. Um, there's a farm in Tennessee called Rose Creek Farms that I think has a lot of YouTube videos about how to grow summer lettuce and also summer carrots. Um, yeah, I would, I would suggest looking up some of what they do. They're, they're outside of Memphis and they sell, I think they sell to restaurants, not right now, of course, but but they like they grew summer carrots and sold them to restaurants for $10 a pound. Whoa. Because no one else can grow them. And because fancy restaurants are willing to pay for that, I guess. But that's that's the kind of margin that you would need in some, like at a certain point. And then you have to decide like, is this really worth it? Or can I just, can I extend the season a little bit? Like our, for us, we're trying to extend the season a little bit by like a few weeks, maybe a month, but we're not gonna really try to grow lettuce, uh, you know, until September. Until like, we'll put it in the ground, we'll try to feed it, but we're not gonna be harvesting it until September. And even then we haven't had much success. Yeah.